How would you categorize the state of dating advice for young people at the moment? Terrible. It's awful. Uh, it's a <laughs> treacherous landscape. It is just barren. Um, one thing that I've been talking a lot about on the show, and I would actually love to hear your thoughts on this because we've talked about dating here and there. Um, I just don't think my generation knows how. Like, I was never taught how to date. My first dating experiences were on dating apps, which is wild. And so I hear about young men not wanting to approach women, and obviously there's the Me Too movement. There's a lot of concerns about rejection. Women are now saying, by and large, they want to be approached, but obviously so many women are just like, oh, that's creepy, whatever. It's just very confusing. There are nuances in dating and approaching women and starting relationships that you kind of have to just learn. And my generation, I don't think we've ever had to do that. I mean, again, like I went to UCLA, was 18, but I went in as a junior and I joined a sorority because I wanted to have like the all-American traditional experience, wanted to do something traditional for once in my life. And right after I rushed the sorority and got in, I was sitting in a room with my big and she was like, you what? My big. Do you know what that is? No. Okay. So in Greek, <laughs> in Greek life, you have like bigs and littles. So uh -huh. I was somebody's little. So when I okay. joined the sorority, there was somebody who is who had already joined a year prior. Right. And they like usher you in or your mentor, your friend. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Bigs and littles. So on, I was with my big. We're on the same page. Yep. Yes. Um, and fraternities have that as well. Anyway, I was sitting with her in her room and they were shocked that I had never been on Tinder, that I had never dated before. They were shocked that I was a virgin. I mean, it was just like, <gasps> like this is insane. How could you? And I mean, I, and I found out later on, I mean, these girls had had, you know, multiple abortions and were very, very sexually and, you know, relationship wise ahead of me. And I had not thought anything of it up until this point because I hadn't been around it. And I just kind of stayed in my own bubble. Um, and they're like, well, you got to get on Tinder. You got to you got to do it. And there's no hazing allowed at UCLA, there's no, especially not in sororities. But they kind of made a joke and they're like, this is you're going to be your hazing. You need to get on dating apps. And this is how you're going to date. And it was so weird. Um, the boy that I dated in college, like my high school, or not high school, my college boyfriend, met on Hinge. Like that was how I dated. That's how everyone around me dated. And so when I hear, you know, people online, when I'm reading in the comment section, like I don't know how to approach somebody. I'm so nervous. Girls not knowing how to respond. Mm -hmm. It's because we've completely lost that. It's not their fault. It's because they've just gone online. You're sliding into DMs. You're swiping right and left. And that's an addictive game in and of itself. And so then now we're seeing, you know, droves of people leaving dating apps, especially with everything that like Bumble did. Bumble had a huge loss when they did their ridiculous rebrand, most idiotic thing they've ever done. Um, people wanting to be off the apps, but not knowing how to date outside of them. So it really is, it's abysmal for a lot of reasons, but especially that is what I've been thinking about recently. Yeah, I, I had this idea of mutually assured deception, mm -hmm. which I think is what a lot of people have. They're so scared of opening up because one of the worst things that you can be is gullible and naive yeah. in dating. You know, there's something kind of cool about being aloof and a bit sardonic and a bit yeah. standoffish. You know, I'm too good for mm -hmm. this. I, there's no way that you could hurt me. Yeah, you know, it's sort of easy come, easy go. Yeah. But I think that that is just a suboptimal solution to a suboptimal problem. Yeah. Like that is someone trying to reverse engineer the dating environment into their preferences yes. as opposed to doing it the other way around. Yeah. So yeah, you have two people, neither of whom are prepared to open up fully in case they get hurt, yeah. both of whom are terrified of being hurt and yes. both of whom just never show themselves to the other person. Correct. So yeah, I think uh, that's a big concern. And then when it comes to the approaching thing and the, the the being in real life, it's always been that way. Like mm -hmm. the reason that the guy that founded CBT founded CBT mm -hmm. was to overcome his approach anxiety for women. Mm -hmm. That was originally what it was designed for. So this has wow. happened for as long as time has been around. The difference now, I think, is that any small psychological challenge becomes pathologized and yes. becomes laid at the feet of the modern world. So this is because of Tinder. This is because of online dating. It's like, what if this was just endemic to being a guy? Yeah. That approaching a woman is going to be scary and always going to be scary. And maybe the difference now is that you're just a bit less socially adept. Mm -hmm. You haven't spent that much more time out and about. You don't have robust social networks. You don't really know as many people, mm -hmm. that kind of a thing. Yeah. And what it feels like from the inside is, oh my God, if only it was 50 years ago, this would have been mm -hmm. super easy, which actually takes a lot of agency away from you, yes. which would have been, it was going to be hard then yep. in 1960. It was and always going to be hard. Precisely. Yep. And the conditions you can overcome are it. different. Correct. The conditions are different and you have to acknowledge that, but that should not be the reason why you turn inward and just say, never mind, I'm giving it up because there is no hope. There were always going to be 
problems. There was always going to be hurdles that you had to overcome with dating. Dating is not easy. Mm. It's not fun. Nobody likes, you know, opening up, you know, and being very vulnerable and be like, stab me in the heart if you don't like me. I mean, nobody likes that. Mm. But if you acknowledge that and understand that, you know, the risk could come with just an incredible reward and an incredible payoff, but you do have to take responsibility and you do have to take those steps. I also think for women, especially women by and large are having, you know, they're setting these insane standards and very, 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 very superficial standards. I mean, you see it on social media. There was that whole trend of like, you know, I want a guy in finance who's six, five blue eyes. Did you see that? She likes wrote this whole song about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And it's a joke, but it's not Hmm. because... They've they have this image in their mind of what kind of guy they want. And I think they see a lot of relationships on social media. They see men on social media. You know, this is going to be the guy that's available to me. When you look at those numbers of, you know, the percentage for both men and women of men who are whatever height they want, make, you know, six figures plus are single, are not overweight, are between this age bracket. It's a rounding error. Yeah. Yeah. And the same goes for women of like, you know, if you want a woman who is not on the left, is not on any kind of um, antidepressants, who's, you know, a certain <laughs> weight. That one is I love the fact that I love the fact that the equivalent for women of a guy being six foot and yes, six figures with a six pack not is mental. not on antidepressants <laughs> and not on the left. Yes. Wow. Not obese. Yeah. I mean, and again, tiny. And obviously I'm not saying have no standards. The bar is, you know, on the floor. Mm. But you also have to meet people where they are and you also have to know what you're bringing to the table and be aware of like what you will be able to get basically. Like what is the mutually, what am I trying to say here? To figure out the right way to phrase this. It's like, who is your equal partner in the dating marketplace? Do you think that there's a case for settling in that case? I don't think, I don't think of it as settling. I think of it as being again, aware of what your options are and what you're bringing to the table. Like I talk to women all the time and, you know, I want this, I want this, I want this. What are you bringing? Like, are you are you the type of woman that these men are going to go for? Are you the high value woman? I kind of hate those terms, but, you know, the high value woman, the high value man. If you aren't going to the gym, if you aren't taking care of yourself, if you, you know, don't like children, if you only care about your career and you don't want to, you know, if you hate the patriarchy, I don't want to support a man, I don't want to care about a man, and you want a provider man, who is, you know, fit, in shape, cares about his health, that's not going to match up. He's not going to go for you. Mm -hmm. And so then if you're not seeing what you want in the dating landscape, I say, like, put it on yourself then. What can you do to level yourself up? If you don't like the options that are available to you, what can you do to put yourself in a situation where you're going to meet those types of people and be on their level? Number one, that just makes you a better human being because you're bettering yourself. But then again, it's putting the agency back on themselves of like, you have the opportunity to make the change. And well, that's a choice. very radical message, I think, to give to women. Mm-hmm. It's kind of radical to give to men because at the moment, there's a lot of sort of despondency and cynicism yes. and, and melancholy on both sides. But especially for women, there's a an insight that I learned a couple of years ago that personal development for men and personal development for women are completely uh, inverted. Mm-hmm. So men are told that the world is immutable and you are mutable. Mm -hmm. So you have to wrap yourself up and change yourself in order to fit around the world. And women are told that the world is mutable and you are immutable. You are Mm -hmm. perfect as you are. And it's the world's problem that you need to change. And to me, that's massively patronizing. But the other reason is that it doesn't actually allow, it doesn't um, empower women to change because they think if there's any problem out there in the world, it's because of the world and not because of yes. me. So if you're today, then say, the reason that you are not getting the kind of guy that you want is maybe your fault. Maybe mm-hmm. there's something you could do to get yourself up to that. No, no, no. You should love yourself as you are, yeah. queen. You're already a yes. 10. He doesn't deserve you. Drives me up a wall. Well, the, pro- <laughs> the, the main problem with it is that there is a small cohort of women for whom growth mindset and improving themselves has been drilled into them. Mm-hmm. And they're just going to run away and pick up all of the good guys yeah. because there's such a small number of them mm-hmm. out there yeah. and the rest of them have been I mean, gaslit the by this shitty why, culture. And that's one of the reasons why I you know, didn't want to put dating on hold just because of my career. And it's interesting. So my mom and I talked a lot about this. She always said, you know, don't date until you're 30. She was, you know, she had you at like thirty eight, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And forty two, I think. And um, and that was kind of a joke, but not a joke. And what she meant by that was know yourself before you get married. Um, she did not mean that in that you know you need to have the perfect career, the perfect house, the perfect job, which I think is such a lie because it's much more fulfilling to build that and get to that point with your significant other. 
But that was kind of the running joke in our family. And then when I graduated college, moved to Nashville, we started seeing the world change, just gender dynamics. I think she, her eyes really woke up or not woke up. Her eyes really opened to all of that and seeing that, you know, dating was not the same as when she was dating. Um, the world stability was just not the same. And so when I, you know, left Idaho and moved to Nashville, she was like, you need to find your person. She was like, because the world Wait is not U-turn, stable. Mom. God damn it. Yeah. And she, yeah. <laughs> so she was saying, you know, this has to be a priority because the good ones are going to get picked up. They probably are being. And, you know, it's great, you know, focus on your career. But the women that are out there knowing that they're going to need a partner hmm. because the world is getting increasingly unstable because we don't know what's happening, you know, in politics, in, you know, whether there's going to be some apocalypse, she's very much a prepper. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also just in terms of values, like those are the ones that are going to be snatched up from the get-go. And she was like, don't put that on hold. She was like, I'm sorry that I told you don't date until you're 30, but that needs, your mindset needs to change about that. And I'm so glad that she did. Where did you meet your husband? Uh, through work. Wow. Yeah. Who knew? Daily Wire? Yeah. God. Always said I would never do it. He, oh, yeah. We both were like, we'll never do this. Both of us were like, never date at work. And it was something, I mean, I don't know. It's like, it sounds so woo-woo, but literally he walked in, I looked at him and I was like, that one. I don't know why. Didn't know anything about him. Something about the way that he carried himself. He's super confident in a very open and engaging way, not a cocky way. I had always gone for very arrogant and cocky guys in the past because I felt like that is what I needed because I thought that other men were going to be and boys at that time in college were going to be intimidated by me and my success mm. and my intelligence mm. and the fact that I, you know, graduated college at 19 years old. Like that was just, I was like, that's what I needed. And then I met him and it was so solid. There was no insecurities. He was so comfortable in his own skin, was not intimidated whatsoever. Um, so caring, so open, just literally just the way that he carried himself. And then got to know him and realized that um, we grew up five miles apart. He went to high school with my brothers. His photo had been in my brother's four yearbooks we have in my mom's office for the last 15 years. And I had no idea when I met him or like laid eyes on him. Um, and so I've said this before, but falling in love with him and marrying him has felt so much like going home because it's like I have that tie to our hometown. Um, it was a, a town that a lot of pretty dysfunctional things happened in my family, one of my brothers passed away and that's where we were living when that happened. And so I've kind of had a complicated relationship. It's Chattanooga here in Tennessee. Um, but all the pieces just kind of came together and it was so easy. I mean, I think I knew within like two weeks of going out with him. I was like, this is who I'm going to marry. This is it. 